Hey everyone, welcome to Redefining HR. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I'm joined by Karsten Wagner. Uh, Karsten is the SVP of People at Maven Clinic, and we're going to talk about his career, uh, what it's like to scale hypergrowth uh, companies at a very early stage in your career, which will be must have been an interesting journey, and uh, and a lot more. So, uh, Karsten, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I'd love to have you introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Lars. I'm going to take you way back. I was born in Bogota, Colombia in the 1980s, which is not the best time to be born in Bogota, Colombia. And when I met her many years later, my birth mother told me that when she was pregnant with me, she was living on the streets, she was starving, and she wasn't sure that she was going to survive. And someone told her about uh, an orphanage in the city that had a clinic that might be able to help her. And she found her way there, and that clinic saved her life, and it also, of course, saved mine. So I was born in an orphanage. I was adopted and grew up in New York, and my whole life, I felt like someone has given me a chance to be here, right? And it's just been this uh, really fortunate, privileged feeling that I tell you about because it carries so much into my career. My career started completely accidentally and then got very intentional. Um, after I graduated from college, I was living overseas for a couple of years in Japan and came home to New York. I was 26 years old, had no idea what I wanted to do, walked into a temp agency and said, hey, can you find me something mission driven? And the next week I started as a temp office manager at ZocDoc, brand new company. And a couple, couple of weeks after that, they gave me a full-time offer and I was hired as the third employee at ZocDoc, and no idea what a startup even was and what a ride it was. I got to do everything the way that you do when you're only three employees at a company. <laughs> I was doing you know, customer service, client training, invoicing. You don't want me doing accounting, truly. Um, <laughs> learning SEM and SEO when those things were relatively new. Um, learning how to pitch journalists and leading PR for a while. Um, and suddenly, you know, over the rotation, got to recruiting and people. And that one just stuck for me. It was so clear that the HR team has such an outsized impact, um, especially when you're building a company. And I felt so lucky to be in that role after having worked in all these other functions of the business because I had a really good sense of the business and what we needed and who we needed and when. Um, it really informed a lot of my recruiting strategy. So I spent five years at ZocDoc um, and... We were about 500 people when I left, you know, unicorn business, Series C or Series D, something like that. And I told myself, all right, that felt like undergrad, right? Like five years of just learning as you go, <laughs> like building and there's a five-year undergrad program. <laughs> um, I told myself, spend the next five years learning from people who know how to do this. Like get, get experience, get good from great people. And um, I joined AppNexus, you know, working in ad tech because their people leader, Michelle Dvorkin, had so much more experience than me, it was amazing. She hired me to be her number two. I joined Up Nexus when we were about 300 people and left a few years later when we were over a thousand. Um, that definitely felt like my masters because it was just an incredibly uh, operationally excellent environment. I learned so much from Michelle and, and all the folks at Up Nexus. Um, then I wanted to round out my career and see what it was actually like to work in a real Silicon Valley startup. So I moved to the West Coast and I met Kelly Dragovich, who was the head of people that hired at the time. She hired me to be her number two. And we, we built and rebuilt, hired, had an incredible time there. And I remember the day she called me and she said, you're ready. Don't go after another number two job it's time for you to go find a company and it's time for you to lead your own team. And I feel so grateful to have a manager who really thought and cared that much about my career and gave me the chance and the time to really think about that. So at the time I was moving my family back to New York and I think I met something like two dozen founders because I'm kind of picky about where I work. And I met Kate Ryder, founder of Maven Clinic, and she just stood out among everybody because one, the mission of Maven is incredible to improve healthcare for women and families, obviously deeply very personal to me. Um, but of, of all the people that I met, all the founders, she was really the only one who said, hey, listen, 
I'm not that experienced in HR. I know our product. I know our business. I know how to go to market and fundraise, but I need a partner to come in with a lot of HR experience and help me build an organization that can scale and really be focused on people in, in smart ways. And um, from that day to this, we've had such a great partnership that's been two and a half years now. I joined Maven. We were 75 people, Series B. Today, we're a Series D unicorn, 300 50 people or something. We look to double again this year. Uh, it's been an incredible experience. And I feel so fortunate to be in a role where I get to give chances and opportunities to other people like so many people along the way have done for me. Yeah, well, I, I, I love that intro and I love the the depth and complexity of that, right? Because you're able to, to connect so many different pivotal life moments um, that got you where you are today. And, and, and what a gift to have leaders, uh, and mentors like that who are, were willing to in, invest in you and say like, you know, don't go after any more number twos. Like it's your time. It's your time yeah. to, to go after that number one. And I want to, you know, kind of go back to the, the first role, you know, at ZocDoc, you know, when you came in, your employee number three, um, company is scaling and, and it's, it's a pretty unique, I think most people tend to, um, you know, I, I've seen a few people that have gone that route. I think most people who are HR executives now, they, you know, they've kind of been in that seat a few times over. Uh, they started in that field. They worked their way out. Maybe they took a detour at some point to better understand the business. Um, but what a formative experience in terms of like starting your career in a few different areas before moving into recruiting. So you, you talked a little bit about how you kind of knew when you when you started touching recruiting in HR and this allowed the impact it allowed you to have uh, on on people's lives, uh, what was it like? W was there a particular moment, you know, when you first started doing the role? And you know, there, there's aspects of recruiting that are very difficult, uh, and, and HR certainly that are very difficult. Um, they can they can you know they can make you question whether that's the field for you. And then there's other aspects that are incredibly gratifying. So that you have the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. What was your kind of early experience like? And and when, when did you when did you hit that high high? And you're just like, this is it. Pretty early, I have to say. Um, I think it's when I started making my own hires. I was a recruiting team of one, right? And we, we didn't have much of an office, so I was renting a one windowless room from a, an attorney's office upstairs in the building we were in, in downtown New York. And it was just me and a LinkedIn account and a phone, just smiling and dialing, calling people. And I felt that high, high you're describing when the people that I sourced and hired suddenly were my coworkers and suddenly having their own impact in the business. And it was all coming together the way I and, and, and all of us at ZocDoc had hoped. It felt incredible to, to be able to do that for our business, but also for these people's careers, because I knew what a great opportunity being early in ZocDoc was, and I wanted other people to be able to have that too. It just felt like we were actually changing the course of people's careers and lives. Um, and that, that's something that is still kind of wondrous to me. Yeah. Well, so, you know, taking a company from employee number three, you know, I don't know how big you were once you kind of got into it, but, you know, leading most of that growth to 400, um, I imagine you learned a lot over that time, uh, both what things to do and things not to do. Like if you, if you were, you know, Carson at the end of that experience, you had a chance to go back in time and talk to Carson at the beginning of that experience, what wisdom would you pass on, uh, that you kind of wish you knew at the beginning? <laughs> So, so many things. How much time do you have? So, <laughs> By the way, I just gave you a time machine. That's kind of special. So uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, in some ways, I think about the job that I have today, you know, working at an early up and coming health tech company based in New York City is kind of like redoing um, my very first job um, but with more experience this time. But to actually answer your question, uh, I think the, the first thing that I learned and that has just uh, really mattered to me along the way is you can't have sales without account management, right? You, you, if you're going to focus so much on recruiting the way that I did, right? I love, I love recruiting. I love building the engine. I love the competitiveness of it. I love getting people in and meeting new people. I love it all. Um, but if you over-index on recruiting and you haven't thought about the infrastructure on the other side of things, making sure you've got people programs, you've got policies that are sharpening, you're able to absorb all of that growth and have an environment where people can really come in and thrive and develop and grow meaningfully, um, you know, something's off. And so I think that would be the first thing I would have told myself all the way back in you know, 2008, 
focus on both of these and not just one. Uh, the other is the importance, and we talk about this a lot at Maven, of one team. The people team is one team. And through hyper growth, you know, and everything starts to break and, and all of the wheels start feeling like they're falling off, and all that normal stuff that comes with hyper growth, it is very easy, at least in my experience, for there to become a real fisher on a people team. And recruiting goes in their direction and HR, people ops, everybody else goes in their direction. And, you know, I, I know companies where the recruiting team and the rest of the HR team aren't even on the same floor. Or they don't even know each other. They don't talk. Um, and I, I told myself um, when I joined Maven, I'm not going to let that happen here. I'm not going to let that happen on my team. So one of our, one of our mantras uh, on the people team at Maven is that any one person can go out on vacation and any other person on the team should be able to do their job. Um, we want to make sure that there's this net. We all feel supported. We all understand what everybody else is doing and the context and the why behind it. We're sharing skills and sharing experiences um, because I think that's how you stay strong and that's how you keep the business moving forward too. Yeah. I mean, like, how does that, how does that look in practice, right? As you have, because obviously within, and I don't know the structure of your people team, but I'm guessing you probably have some people that are more, you know, specialists, TA, total rewards, et cetera, learning. Um, some yeah. people that are more generalist, business partners, uh, et cetera. Like, how do you, especially for the specialist roles where, you know, they tend to go deep in a particular subject matter and maybe have, do you have like formal programs to to, you know, cross train or kind of, uh, allow them to maybe shadow people in other disciplines so that they can carry that weight. If somebody's out, I wouldn't call it formal programs just yet, but part of our goal setting process, you know, quarterly, when we look at our OKRs, we sit down as a team and say, here are the things that we want to accomplish. Of course we assign an owner to each of those. And as we're putting together our spreadsheet, we have another column that says, Hey, who wants to, who wants to shadow? Who wants to join? Who wants to stretch a little bit? Um, and I've seen you know, recruiters and sourcers take on onboarding, build, building onboarding programs and all these kinds of things with direction and support from everyone else on the team. But to me, it all goes back to giving people opportunity and giving people chances to grow and learn about themselves and what they want to do. Um, so talk to me in six to 12 months when we're a little bit bigger and without having a real formalized program there. Um, but for now it's just kind of a tradition for us. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's really smart. Like I, I remember even in my own career back in the day, like this is back, back in the day, earlier in my career when I was running, uh, when I was the first time, uh, I, would, I took over a leadership role leading a recruiting team at Ticketmaster. And one of the things I tried to do is say, okay, like we all love to recruit. Like we all can recruit all day and that will be very gratifying for us. But like we need something else in addition to that. And so we always try to say like, okay, everybody has to own one project. Like what's a wish list project? It could be related to recruiting. It might be something else. Um, but what is that? And then you have that thing that you can invest time in and grow and stretch yourself. And so I, I think it's just, I'm, I'm on board with that. I think it's a really smart uh, approach. Um, and you gave a bit of an overview uh, in your introduction on Maven Clinic, but I'd like to go a little bit deeper just for listeners and viewers that may not be familiar with Maven Clinic. Could you give an overview of, of, of the business and, and what you do? Sure. So Maven is the largest virtual clinic for women's and family health. Um, we have a virtual platform and it spans the entire family journey through holistic continuous care. So fertility, maternity, adoption, parenting, pediatrics, return to work. We have doctors, providers, and specialists who can support you on any and all of those journeys. I can tell you as a user myself, you know, my daughter never breaks out in a crazy rash or falls and hits her head between the hours of nine to five on a weekday. It's, it's always some kind of crazy time or like right before you're going on vacation or something. And opening up the Maven app, booking an appointment with a pediatrician in the next 10 minutes, you know, getting that person to do a video appointment with us, you know, taking care of my daughter, putting me and my husband at ease as well. It's just a lifesaver. Maven is amazing for working parents. Um, and I, I just, I'm so proud to be part of that. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, you mentioned when you were kind of thinking about, when you moved back to New York with your family, you were thinking about a role, you're really looking for a mission driven role. How, you know, it's interesting hearing your story kind of coming from Bogota, you know, being adopted, being able to reconnect with your birth mother. 
how much of that, like I can just imagine like when this opportunity came your way and just the alignment of all those things that were pivotal moments in, in your own life, yeah. like what, what, what was that like for you when, when this kind of came to be as, as an opportunity for your career? It felt like I couldn't take any other job and not just because of my own experience being adopted and, and knowing my birth mom now is a real good friend of mine and um, that, but also my husband and I adopted our daughter. So we went through our own adoption journey. And for anyone listening to this podcast who's been through the adoption experience, you all know that it is an emotional roller coaster. And um, I wish that my husband and I had had the support that Maven gives when we were going through that experience for ourselves. And so um, I'm really proud to work at Maven, not only because the work we do takes care and helps people like my birth mom, but also because they help parents and, and um, soon to be parents like my husband and me. And it's just a, a real lifesaver for us. And I'm curious, you wrote a piece um, last year just about some of the um, the added um, burden of the pandemic on parents specifically. Yeah. And obviously, you know, we don't need to like narrow it on any one group. Everybody has felt the weight of this for, you know, two plus years now. And so let's, you know, we, we're all kind of going through this and carrying a lot from it. Um, but there is a unique burden on, on parents and caregivers as well. And, and I'm curious, like when you, are, are there any programs that you were able to bring into Maven to specifically, um, you know, uh, re release or, or alleviate some of that additional burden that, that parents felt? Yeah, there are a few things that we did, um, some that, that seem really obvious in hindsight, like we needed to know who our parents were and know who our caregivers were. That's not something every company knows. And that's probably like the first step is figuring out who, who your audience is there. Um, I, I remember the day we got our first call. This is in the darkest days of COVID with all of, all of our, our parents at Maven on the call. And just seeing their faces light up and their shoulders ease a little bit because they knew they were looking at other people who were experiencing what they were experiencing, that meant so much. Um, just creating a forum for those folks to give advice, vent a little bit, share recipes or anything that kind of helped them during that time. Um, other programs that we've done are just kind of always asking what they need kind of on a regular cadence because those needs evolve, especially seasonally when school is in or not in session. Um, we've also leaned a lot on Maven providers. So we've had Maven providers come in specifically to talk about burnout and balance as a working parent. Um, and then finally, I think that it's just super important to engage your non-parents too, um, especially your managers who are non-parents, making sure that they're bringing that lens of empathy to people on their teams who are just kind of going through a different kind of struggle. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting too. I think that as uh, as parents, you know, we're we're both parents, um, and and frankly, I think when you look at society as a whole, one of the things that you know we we won't know yet, and we're only in the early early days of finding out, is just like how many people have really recalibrated their their priorities and their life choices based on what we've experienced over the last two years. And I think a lot of people, you know, we we're coming out of this probably sustained much longer than it needed to be a period of like hustle culture, right. And grind and work and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, now we're, we're moving to something else and exactly what that is. I don't think we quite know yet, but I think that for a lot of people, it, it's caused a lot of introspection uh, around like how they prioritize and balance, you know, family uh, obligations and, and work obligations. And, you know, obviously this impacts all employees, but it impacts us as well as practitioners and, and people leaders. So I'd love to get your perspective. Like how, how is this, how has the experience of the last couple of years um, shaped how you kind of view your own personal balance between being a parent and being a, a leader in an organization? Yeah. Thanks for asking that. I, I, um, <laughs> I feel like you, you, you're seeing me at my core, right? Because I'm definitely getting through some of that, that introspection myself, just in terms of, you know, what have I learned over these past two years and, and how does it affect my life and how I spend my time? Because the, the first thing that I learned through this pandemic, like so many others, is just the value of time and how little of it we're given, right? And how valuable it is and, and where we spend it and what we want to do. 
And, and, and how does that reconcile with this hustle culture, the definition of success of always being on and always being accessible and working so much and something that I think a lot about and I'm experimenting with myself personally right now is being really, really strong about the boundaries that I set um, and encouraging others to do the same. So I've really asked myself, do I need to have my work email on my phone? Do I need to have Slack on my phone? Do I, do I need work in my pocket every day? And for me, those answers have been no. Um, and it's working. And I tell my team, you should try it. And everybody's just horrified <laughs> when, when I suggest this. But um, being really clear and intentional with myself about when I work and when I'm not has helped me so much. Over the past two years, I haven't missed a dinner with my family. And I'm, I don't want to lose that. And I also don't want to have dinners anymore where you know, I've got one eye on my kid and the other eye on my phone just to make sure that no email is coming through, right? So I think there's this, um, this real uh, reckoning that, that, that you're talking about, that we have to think about what is the definition of success? Is, is it how hard we push ourselves and how much we show up and how long that green light is on on Slack? Or is it something else? Um, and you're right, we won't know the answers to that for a long time, but um, I feel fortunate to be in a position where I can advocate for my family, because I think if I do that, it kind of uh, allows other people on my team and in my company to do the same for their families too. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, you kind of end with a great point just around role modeling that behavior, because I think uh, it's, you know, it's easy to say as an organization, we value flexibility, you know, we value uh, separation between work. But like if all the leaders are doing all those things that, you know, you mentioned you used to do, and frankly, I think is probably the default mode for most leaders, right, of just having the phone, you know, as I, you know, I'll call myself out, like I, I still am learning how to kind of create those boundaries uh, in, in this always on environment. And, uh, you know, I make some strides, I, I slide back. I think, you know, it, it's, it's a hard thing to be committed. So I applaud you for being able to commit to it for one, because I know that's not easy. Um, but I'm curious to get your perspective. Like when you think part of this new, you know, we're, we're in this real pivotal time for the field of, of HR and people operations more broadly where, you know, I, I you know, we're, it's not an understatement to say like we're, we're redefining work itself. Like we're, we're, we're writing the new playbook for what work is. And uh, a key element of this new world of work for most organizations and most employees is this notion of flexibility. Um, and as we move away from kind of industrial era constructs of work that were very tightly defi refined around like where we work and when we work and how we work and we're moving into this new thing that's a bit more nebulous and we you know don't have to be in an office necessarily, don't have to be nine to five necessarily, uh, don't have to be Monday through Friday. And you know, yes, I'm talking about a segment of the workforce now, um, but those things aren't necessarily the case. And I'm just curious to get your perspective. Like when you think about flexibility and the need for flexibility as we design this new world of work, what, what does that mean to you? That's a great question. I ask myself this often because all we've talked about over the past two years is flexibility, almost to the point where I'm not clear what flexibility actually means, right? There, there are certain obvious things, right, that you can do to make sure that you're empowering people to find the right rhythms in their days, right? You tell people, oh, you, you don't have to be on at a certain time because you have to do drop off or take care of your dog or whatever it happens to be. You can encourage uh, blocks of time in the day where you have no internal meetings or as a company decide days or times when you have no internal meetings. But like you said, um, it's very easy to slide back on those kinds of things. That that's why I, I'm asking myself, I, I, I hope you're not looking for an answer. I have no answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking myself if it's flexibility that is the real answer here or if it's this kind of discipline I'm talking about bringing this intentionality to when we work and when we don't and encouraging that for others. On my team at Maven, we talk often about if, if things are good at home, things are good at work, right? We want people showing up feeling like they've got everything else in their lives covered. And so we have some, some part of responsibility in that, making sure that um, they all feel like we know they bring a whole life with them to work. And I think what the pandemic did was put that whole life in our face, right? And everybody's Zoom background. And so I think we have um, a real opportunity now to not just think about our employee as an employee, but as a, a full person who in some ways knows better what's for them than we do. And so it's, it's navigating that balance 
between the, kind of the dynamic between employer and employee um, and making sure that everybody's getting what they need. Yeah. You know, and uh, Carson, one more question for you just to kind of, you know, before we move in the lightning round, you know, we, we were talking before we began recording, we actually met it's probably five, six years ago uh, on a HR conference on a boat uh, north or outside of London. And it was a really interesting experience, but, you know, I'm kind of connecting the dots here. We're also both members of People Tech Partners, yeah. uh, which is a, a vibrant um, both uh, HR tech accelerator, but also HR leader community. And, you know, I, I've, I've always been a huge proponent for community uh, in, in HR specifically and also open source in HR specifically. And, and I feel that particularly over the last couple of years and certainly since the pandemic, the power of that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is just reinforced time and time again. And, and I'm obviously, I come from this from a very, uh, I have a very, you know, shaped view around community and open source, but I'm also not in your seat. I'm not a practitioner, uh, you know, right now I, I'm on the outside. And so I'd love to get your perspective, you know, as an operator, as a practitioner, as a leader, like what role does community play in, in your world? Oh man, it is humbling to be a part of People Tech Partners and many of the other groups that I'm a part of as well, Venwise in New York and lots of other Slack channels and email distribution groups I'm a part of. I couldn't do this job if I didn't have the community that I have. Um, and I just think that HR in particular, uh, so glad to be a part of, of this job in this career because it's such a giving group of people, right? Um, and so when I think about my own development, not only have I learned from great leaders along the way in HR and outside of HR, but now just, um, there's so many people that I can look up to um, who are willing to share their insights and share their thoughts. And especially over the past two years as we're all going through something that no one else could have prepared for. Um, it's, it's been humbling uh, to get the chance to talk to people um, who can help guide me along the way. Yeah, I, I agree with all that and I appreciate the feedback and I'm you know grateful to have the opportunity to also collaborate and learn with people like you in groups like PTP and other other networks. So, um, you know, the future of HR is open and uh, that's been just reinforced consistently, um, certainly since the pandemic. So it's a uh, it's a new chapter for us uh, right. and, and I'm really excited about where we take this together. Um, Karsten, I really appreciate you sharing your, your story, your career, your kind of life and how that's all, uh, impacted who you are and how you think about your role today. So, um, we close out every episode with a lightning round to help the, uh, the audience get to know you a little bit better. So you ready to jump in? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. So we always open with music. Uh, we're having a safe get together. You're the DJ and your first, uh, three tracks are three of your most played artists. Who would they be? Oh, uh, my most played artists right now. Uh, I, I grew up on Long Island and I think it's the law. So I think my most played artist is Billy Joel. <laughs> 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 um, my husband and I took our daughter to see the Nutcracker Ballet a couple months ago, and we are still listening to the Nutcracker. So I guess my second artist is Tchaikovsky. Okay. <laughs> and, and my third party, with my, my third uh, artist who might actually be the most appropriate for the party you're describing um, is Whitney Houston, because she always brings the party. She does bring the party. Okay. Um, we're going to shift to TV. Um, what was your latest binge? Oh, man. RuPaul's Drag Race. And I have to tell you, I admire RuPaul so much. This person is the living embodiment of the things that make you strange or the things that make you powerful. And yeah. I so admire the platform that he created for all of these people to talk about their lived experiences as queer people in this country. And now with this global audience of young people who can feel like they're not alone, I just, I love what RuPaul has done and just admire it so much. Um, you um, are shifting careers. You can't work in HR anymore. You're going to do something different. Uh, what would you do? I'd probably work in politics. What It Takes is one of my favorite books. And The West Wing is one of my favorite shows. So I don't know if I'd run for anything. <laughs> um, but I'd probably work uh, maybe as a speechwriter or um, a press secretary somewhere in politics. Okay. And uh, Carson, last question for you. Uh, who is one HR leader you admire and why? So many. Um, but, but the person who's probably closest to my heart is Kelly Dragovich, who was my manager at Hired. Um, 
we got my husband and I got the call on a Tuesday morning that that our daughter was uh, going to be born in three days and that we were about to become parents. And Kelly um, and and her wife went through the the experience of becoming parents too. And she took such good care of me and us during that time, making sure I got and took the leave that I needed. Um, And for that, I'm always going to be forever grateful. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, Karsten, it was great catching up with you. I really appreciate you uh, sharing your story and the work that you're doing. And um, thanks so much for making time. Thank you, Lars. This has been great.